Hello, everybody. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Michael Mejia, tonight's reader and our lead-off reader for the year of the reading sponsored by the Korean Writing Program here at Notre Dame. I first came upon Michael Mejia's fiction when I read his novel Forgetfulness, which is up here. Um, which is a collage novel in two parts. The first part juxtaposes scenes imagined around historical figures such as Freud, Trotsky, and Heisenberg. And around these characters swirl news articles, theatrical scripts, and other cultural artifacts that together depict the rise of modernism in Middle Europe, leading up to the Hitler years. The column at the center of the swirl is the Austrian composer Anton von Verbrun, who writes beautifully clean music, 12-tone music, while civilization around him is churned by the radical transformations in technology, politics, and the move to war. Using fiction to bring together facts, Mejia creates a mosaic picture of the pastoral Viennese world as it explodes and goes into decline. The second half of the novel jumps to the 1980s where it picks up the aftermath of this period by following the thoughts of von Verber's biographer, an archivist, and a retired opera so soprano. The events of the first half of the novel are revisited through the perspectives of these three characters who remember the history differently. That is, we see them creating a history of the period we've just witnessed in the first half of the novel. Or, more accurate, accurately, we see them misremember events or remember them differently. We see them select some details but not others or emphasize different aspects while forgetting others. To varying degrees, they remember, misremember, for, forget, or suppress the idealism of the time, as well as the crimes committed in the name of idealism. Significantly, all this is happening on the eve of a former, of a former Nazi's election to president, the very non-fictional Kurt Qualheim, whose election comes across as the embodiment of forgetfulness, or call it our capacity to repeat the mistakes of the past. And I think you can see the um, relevance of forgetfulness to today, the time when the optimism of the wonderful world provided by tech giants, to say just one example, gradually becomes weaponized as fake news, uber surveillance, and the rest of the cultural transformation that allow for dictator wannabes to come into power. Like forgetfulness, Michael Mejia's latest novel, Tokyo, also here, is a meticulously researched, insightful historical collage of a novel that has as its ultimate goal an exploration of philosophical territory, the ethics of appropriation, the creation of narrative, and how these narratives ultimately become history or fiction. It opens with Ido Sandarha, a salary man working for a large corporation in Japan that catches and sells high-grade bluefin tuna. It falls to Sando Hara to write a corporate report about the tuna affair. That is, the fact that human bodies have begun to show up in these enormous fish, not in their stomachs, but as part of the very fish themselves. This quasi-fairy tale, told in the form of a business report, echoes loudly with the environmental concerns of today, where to cite just one example, to put toxins like mercury in the seas, the fish eat the mercury, and we eat the fish, thus absorbing our own poisons. Written in a style reminiscent of what is often called the world's first novel, The Tale of the Genji, the boundaries of the real and fantastic blur. The subway writer you're talking to may in fact be a god, or the most impeccable reasoning could collapse in a fever dream. That is, like Michael Mejia's other fiction, the importance of Tokyo only seems magnified by developments in our present political climate. Or maybe it's the other way around. That is, its importance arises from the intelligence with which it invites readers to engage with the making of narrative, both historical and personal. That is, the structures of the narratives we make up about ourselves to tell and retell to ourselves until they become received truth. Our families and our cultures and even ourselves get told through these stories, and much like, unlike much of Michael Mejia's fiction, Tokyo is characterized by a remarkable facility to bring together disparate ways of writing and thinking. In the guise of a historian, he revisits the relevant documents and textual work, rereading them in the light of each other and the contemporary moment. 
in the guise of a cultural critic, he puts the historians themselves and other gatekeepers of our public narratives under analysis. In the guise of a novelist, he shapes this material into his own narrative that is moving, at times hilarious, always as entertaining as it is instructive. Always this is heady intellectual stuff, a breath of fresh air that demonstrates all the novel can be at a time when it is too often reduced to simple entertainment or its commercial concerns. A recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment of the Arts and the Ludwig Wolkenstein Foundation is also the editor-in-chief of the Western Humanities Review, a co-founding editor of Nine Bark Press, and a professor of creative writing at the University of Utah. Please join me in welcoming Michael Mejia. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one sec. Shut. I did be there. Sorry about that. Um, okay, thank you, uh, and uh, just thanks to Steve, thanks to Notre uh, Dame for bringing me out here. I really appreciate um, the opportunity, and, um, and thanks to all of you for, for accommodating. Um, so, uh, just following up on Steve's introduction of the book, what I'm going to read to you uh, to start with is an excerpt from um, a report written by uh, a Japanese executive. Uh, in the mid-1990s, a private report uh, to um, a government official about um, a strange occurrence at the Japanese fish market, Skiji, um, which no longer exists, actually closed in October, and has now sort of been relocated to another place. Uh, so this is now a historical novel. Um, these, as, are you seeing the photographs? Those are images that appear in the book. Um, several of the, the black and white photos I took myself while I was in Tokyo. Um, in this section, um, the executive mentions uh, his wife, Sato, a Japanese-American, uh, from whom he's, uh, uh, at this time, uh, estranged. Saburo and I entered the Tokyo Central Wholesale Market at approximately 7.45 on the morning of 21st April. Skiji was hurtling toward the final half of its day. Bicyclists and tares careened through the crowd, the men and the machines all seeming to balance equally great numbers of cages, crates, and boxes. Cranes groaned on the docks, loading and unloading hauls of flash frozen fish from every sea, lake, river, pond, bay, and ocean around the world. Redfish and Atlantic cod, albacore, fugu, king and queen mackerel, flounder, swordfish, shark and salmon, Herring, ruffy, and pollock, tuna. Lights flashed and sirens wailed. Engines and hydraulic systems hummed, creaked, and whined through their business, their sounds so in harmony with the human pandemonium that it seemed every object, every person, every breeze blowing ripples through the market's bright banners was somehow driven by the operations of a vast and covert system of flywheels, pistons, and spinning shafts. The grandeur of the spectacle made me forget Santo for the moment as well as the bother of having to leave my office. Skiji swirled around me, spread itself open before me, a voluptuous garden, solicitous, overripe with fish, meat, and produce, with the scent of 2,000 flowers, with humanity, buyers, and sellers, the seemingly innumerable rows of stalls and tables and stands and workers stretching away into the distance in every direction, a great organic machine, oblivious to the existence of a larger world circumscribing it, regulating its systems. There is no air in Skiji, Minister, only water, 
and one must learn to breathe it to survive. Salty bay fog and fresh spray of hoses, mist rising from the defrosting fish, steam from a tea kettle. My socks grew damp as the wet sheen of the cement found its way through the unprotected seams of my soles. A pair of spirited women sifted through bins of beans and mushrooms, while nearby a man shook his head and washed shrimp. And, we're, uh, and there were younger ones laughing as they chopped the heads off salmon, joking about the previous night's swallows bay star baseball game. There were buckets of clams and oysters, quivering sardines, tanks of lobsters. From every restaurant came the smell of tempura and yosinabe, oyakodon and kawayaki. Young boys and women hand-rolled sushi for floor managers, reading the newspaper on their break. They were all new men, these managers, a generation or more younger than myself, and I knew I would never know them. There was a time when, at every step through Skiji, I would have encountered a friend or an acquaintance that was only a short while ago. The comings and goings of people in my business, as well as yours, Minister, are infinitely more swift and unambiguous than the fluctuations of the catch. But as quickly as I was delighted by Skiji that morning, I became resentful of it. These beautiful, this beautiful garden I had been admiring as if from a distance, the distance of Uakai's 19th floor through an autumn haze of a nostalgia, was, in fact, as it always had been, a wilderness, unmanaged, writhing, and unrestrainable, lacking any sense of moderation, a severely infectious condition that was evident in the afflicted countenances all around me, a condition that was perhaps as much to blame for my loss of Sato as any fickleness in her heart, in her character, or any act of seduction. If it was true, as I believed, that I had been sharing my wife with another man, I could not have been doing so with any equity, and this seemed even more shameful than sharing it itself. It is at such moments of despair, Minister, that the most devastating strain of regret sets its teeth in. There, caught in the market's whirlpool heart, my palm recalled the weight of Sato's breast. My nose knew the scent of her skin. The taste of her body slid across my tongue. Beneath my raincoat, held fast against my ribs by the pressure of my arm, the portrait was still hidden. The frame's sharp edges stabbing me, the cool glass and lacquer giving me a sudden chill through my shirt. For the first time since receiving the news of Sato's collapse, perhaps even since her departure, I felt fully awake grotesquely aware of myself in the, in the world, this parallel world that I had never known existed. I saw myself reflected in the fishy eye of a convex mirror, alone, foreshortened, shivering in damp ignominy. I needed to get away, out to the street, but when I turned to Sabo, he had disappeared. Looking on every side, I found myself boxed in by stacks of wire cages full of frogs, all heaped upon each other's bloated, filthy bodies, unmoving, indifferent, unbleaking, staring out in whichever direction they happened to be facing when they were packed for shipment. For the slight moment, uh, movements of their breathing, I would not even have thought them alive. One particular set of eyes stared out at me. They knew me. Did I cry out at this horror, Minister? I meant to. Indeed, I covered my ears to block out a prolonged and horrific keening that sent the frogs into a panic. I heard my name in their wild croaking and the strange rasping they made as they struggled to escape their fate. Then they were gone, spirited away by a great gold forklift. And again I heard my name. It was Kabuta, standing there in front of me, where the frogs had been, Saburo at his side, and though it took me a moment to acknowledge them, they seemed to take no notice of my agitation. The tuna cutter, grizzly in his spattered, slimy apron, and inclined his head in greeting and motioned for me to follow him to our tuna stall. I obeyed. Though he and Sabado exchanged a few short words about along the way, neither attempted to brief me further about the tuna affair. Three or four men were at work cutting up a large bluefin when we arrived, and I stopped to observe them. The fish was short but bulky. The healthy red meat of its belly was, very, was, uh, was well marbled and looked particularly valuable. It appeared to be a very good eye. And the sight of it, as well as the air of deference I sensed from the workers when I arrived, helped to restore my composure. Indeed, watching the crew dismantle the fish with well-rehearsed ease made me ponder the speed with which chaos may turn to order, dread to tranquility, flesh to food, and vice versa. These seeming oppositions, separated only by a thin membrane of circumstance, unstable, contiguous states we inhabit and abandon at the whim of, at the whim of some force or condition beyond our control, as readily as water turns to ice, turns to vapor, and back again. Is it possible, Minister, that truth, too, is such a substance? 
not developing as we may believe from blind ignorance toward clarity and understanding, but rather suffering its nature to be more constantly and randomly remade. What was the problem? I asked him more finally. This fish looked excellent. He pointed to the back corner of the stall where another larger fish lay on the low wooden table beneath a makeshift canvas awning. The working men looked up at us, their gaze following the direction of Kimura's silent gesture. They looked back at me, then set to hacking the spine out of an open fish before them. Though I did not know what to make of these glances, they seemed to me more indicative of the seriousness of the situation than anything I had seen or heard thus far that morning. The second tuna was massive, looking to be well over 500 kilos. It would bring a very fine profit if the meat was as good as that of the first. Except for a slight strangeness in its eyes, the fish appeared to have no visible defects. I asked Kimura again, more pointedly, what the problem was, and I let it be known that it irritated me to see such a valuable fish being allowed to sit and stink. Kimura motioned for Saburo and me to stand closer together over the tuna to block the view from the adjoining stalls, giving me one final glance in preparation. He kneeled and shoved his thick fingers into the tuna, wedging them into the cut he had already made in the belly to have it. Then he lifted. Minister, I do not have the words to describe the mixture of shock, sickness, and amusement I felt at what I saw when Kamura opened the tuna. I say amusement because, as my initial horror receded, I was certain, more certain than when Sabado had first appeared in my office that morning, that someone was playing a joke. This feeling did not last long. Inside was the body of a woman, naked, gutted, perfectly half, just like the fish, from crotch to crown. She was not a midget or a girl, but a miniature adult female in her late thirties, forty at the most, fully formed and developed with long black hair, her body perfectly proportioned to fit inside the skin of the fish. The skin the, the tuna itself had no inner organs or skeleton. It was apparent that its skin served only as an outer covering for the small woman inside, and that what flesh there was to the fish was only a kind of padding to fill out its shape so that it, the tuna, gave no sign to either fish or fisherman that it carried a woman inside, that it was anything other than an average blue pin tuna. She was beautiful, Mr. The entire construction was masterful, so much so that it seemed shockingly organic. Perhaps the most horrifying aspect of the thing, even now I am uncomfortable with the term monster, was the naturalness of the woman's expression of anxious surprise, the slight tension remaining in her muscles, traces of emotions or instincts that seemed both human and less than human, heightening the ambiguity of her origin, her species. I had never seen her before, of course, this small woman, yet her, her features begged me to recall a name or a similar face, perhaps that of someone I'd encountered once briefly in a crowd or seen on television. My initial physical sickness evolved into a spiritual one. Curiously, this death felt to me are there any others like this? I asked him. There were not. I asked Sabado how much he had paid for it. 563000 he said. I cannot authorize the disposal of so costly a fish without consulting Sinkai san I told Kimura and Sabado to wrap up the tuna and lock it in the freezer. Instruct the other men not to say a word to anyone, I told Kimura. Tell them to say nothing or But I did not know how to finish. What was the extent of the danger? With what could I threaten them that would keep them? from telling even their lives. I turned to watch the men working. None of them spoke or looked up. Though I was certain that they felt my eyes upon them, it seemed to me that they were all anxiously anticipating the moment later that day when, their work complete, they would pass beyond the borders of Skiji, and perhaps at a supper table, perhaps at a bar, at least one of them would reveal something of our secret catastrophe. Nothing could prevent this. I turned back to Kimura. Just tell them, I said. Tell them to say nothing. Tell them that no one must know about this until I have corresponded with the singers. So, as I said, this was written by um, a Japanese executive um, at a fishing concern in Tokyo. Um, or not. Uh, the, 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 the intention, obviously, was to sort of create that sense. And he signed his name. I've signed my name. It is Ito Sahara. Right, the, the question for me became after after writing this, um, what was I thinking? Right, that, that, uh, I um, the, the, this work, um, this initial report was inspired by a National Geographic article about the, the the fish market in Tokyo and about the declining catch um, 
in, in the oceans. This was back, in the, in, as I said, in the mid-90s. Uh, and there were a number of people who responded to this piece and sort of asking me, like, oh, this is, you know, when were you in Japan? And I thought, um, I, I told them, I, I've never been to Japan. But, you know, it was like a great um, sort of success in some sense that I had um, made it appear that I had been to Japan. Um, and as the years went by, I thought, you know, this is strange. This is weird. Like, why, why am I proud of this? That I sort of like fool people into thinking that that I um, not only have been to Japan, but that I've sold them this Japanese voice that is not mine. Um, and rather than sort of completely disavow that, I wanted to try and understand like who who Sada, uh, Ito Sadahara was. Right? It's me, but in some way also very much not me. Um, so. You know, the rest of the book is really sort of investigating that idea of, of you know, appropriation, um, how and why this particular appropriation got made to explore that through uh, sort of fictional you know, retreatments, in a sense, of, this, of the same images. Um, in some sense, you know, that, um, that initial report had a narrative thrust, a narrative arc that was um, akin to more conventional fiction. Um, uh, you know that sort of gets resolved at the end. Um, but what was interesting to me was the mystery of the of you know the lingering mystery for me uh, was the, the the woman and the fish and what and all those all the ways in which she seemed like a kind of key to trying to understand what I was what I was after. Um, so what I'm going to read for you now are a couple of sections from uh, the second part of the book or the third part of the book, excuse me, um, where you'll see you know how I've tried to sort of, you know, approach again those images and sort of try to think through some of these problems of, um, you know, appropriation, changing voices, etc. Performance, essentially. A slit in the body, passage for the experienced hand, her father's hand, entrance or exit. Are they male or female, these fish? Bellies sliced open, gills cut out with a short sword on the deck of whatever ship landed them in whatever sea. Harvested fins and tails sliced away, sometimes also heads. Bodies sheathed in frost, mist curling around them, arranged orderly across the auction floor. These two men. Buyers huddled with auctioneers, her father explains, acquiring about each one's province, asking for a little more, a hint, a tip, any sign of reaching into that wound with the unctuous slit to touch the fat, examining the surface for flaws, signs of a damaging struggle, hints of, in, of the internal burn that turns the thick flesh soft, watery, white, excavating the tail end with his hand tool, his single-clawed takagi. He extracts a chunk of flesh, rolls it between thumb and forefinger, performing for her, shines his flashlight on her face to make her smile, then on the meat, pops the scrap in, her mouth, in his mouth, makes some notes about color, oil, translucence. The girl, ten, maybe eleven, wearing galoshes like everyone else, standing in the wet, scuffing through blood, pink galoshes, free from school because it's Friday, the day before Children's Day. Because he wants her to see this, or she wants to see this, or they have no choice, no other option, because school is out and her mother is where? At work, home, away, gone, gone back to America, lost just another body, or they wanted her, the girl, to see, to show her these bodies, to show her what takes her father away while she's sleeping, the source or one source of their food, of her home, her comfort, of all that she knows, all they share as a family, all her life, for as long as she remembers, since before she was born, the watery, the bloody. Could she know this, the moment of her beginning? To imagine home as a body, this maimed, half-frozen body on the floor at her feet to equate them for the first time. This is that. The dirty, the sordid, this world of buying and selling. This is home, she thinks. This fish, this body. This is my jacket. This fish, my galoshes, doll, bed, book. This is me, us. Around noon is when it gives him back this world, when it relinquishes him back into light, into air, his bedtime, the same as hers, even earlier, for now, for a few more years, he says, before you're up all night with me, with a tutor, cramming. She doesn't want to think about it. 
it, to imagine herself inside, at home in there, this fish, as it had been at the beginning. Is it male or female, the slit of the body? Working her way out into air, burrowing, oh, eating her way through the soft flesh, its translucence, otro, otro, the snap of its skin, opening its scaled surface for her from the inside, to imagine herself in another as she was in mother, the watery world, the bloody little fish, they say they called her before she was born. Did he see her, see her coming, naked, face almost entirely covered with blood? Or was he here at Skiji, one hand inside? Can she, could she remember it if she tried? That memory of being born, stored somewhere in her, in her flesh, a little fish. Now, here in pink galoshes, standing again in water and blood, what her father knows about them, these bodies, how he sees them as potential and defect, kilos of valuable flesh, translucent, the thing that precedes food, the perfect fish, the perfect shape, the perfect, flash, the perfect flashing through his head, information in flesh, his strange power, strange sight, and how he looks at her sometimes, little fish. But also taste and texture, that fish in him, that flesh in every part is him and her too. This is that, that flesh is mine, that translucence, the underneath. This room will be empty, he says, every body sold in seconds, gone, wheeled away, then back again tomorrow, but new, the same, but different, kilos and kilos of flesh. Still, his little fish, for a while longer, for a few more years, until she loses her tail, he says, becomes fully herself a young woman, Ipanji, who's an ordinary person, an outsider, like any other visitor, Taijin calls that woman, Gashokuji. Not his, but another man's, not Skiji's, not anymore. She doesn't want to think about it. Handbells ringing, the auctioneers step onto their footstools, chanting, will you pay, will you pay, each in his own manner. The buyers, her father, making laconic gestures, the same every day. Index finger and thumb, claw, fist, wagging hand, the winning bid written right on the tuna's skin, in black ink, as if on mulberry paper. More than ten years ago, Sahara saw that girl. Back in early Heisei, the day before Children's Day, the first time he's sure that he saw himself in another, as another, not dressed in her skin as if it were a costume, but in the very flesh, a young woman emerging unsteadily. This is that. And then catching his father's eye, Serizawa Sensei, watching him, watching the girl, as if making the same calculations, connecting the same points with the same lines, as if completing some complex equation in his head. So the Sadahara that I just mentioned is not Ito Sadahara, but another version of Ito Sadahara. Um, that's the thing about this uh, novel as it goes on, is that you know, identities are always shifting um, and, and, and unstable, um, and, and you know, essentially serving as, as masks and word ropes for the, the shifting ideas that, um, uh, the, that I'm addressing here. Um, so here's another, another sort of version of that image from a little bit later in the third section um, that focuses on uh, a character, M, and S, who may or may not be a woman. M may or may not be an American author or a filmmaker or someone else. But when he arrives, it's already too late. The key he'd been given wrapped in thin blue paper with Mysteria Blossoms, opened the door, room 2082, just as the note had said it would. A room of shelves crammed tight with books on fish, market histories, poetry, novels, manga, an old wooden desk and a shabby central table, covered with more volumes, scattered with newspapers and industry magazines. In the back room, the Japanese room, he passed through the tokonoma, through the secret door, into the mirrored hall, where she, where S. But there's nothing. No one, just the largest tuna the detective has ever seen. Lying on its side on the bare concrete floor lit by a single dangling bowl, light reflecting harshly on the lacquer-like sheen, the defrosting fish's damp surface, its belly sliced open, revealing fine meat, the severed crescent of its tail shoved up into the gap where its gills once were, a commonplace at Skiji, though in this context it seems a message, a threat of 
humiliation. So, they'd expect her. But what about S? Had they really brought her here, as she predicted? Or was it all set up? Has she been in on it? He turns in place, scanning his reflection, as if one might move independently of him, as if they, someone, might be back there, behind any one of them, watching. But what else can he do? He can't ease up. The long time has started. He circles the fish, the floor seeming to suck at the soles of his shoes. His legs feel weak. Who would sacrifice such an enormous, enormously profitable specimen like this? Only a clan, of course, a corporate conspiracy, a diverse criminal syndicate with money and influence and nothing to lose. Peering into the fish's upturned, milky eye, he sees nothing unusual. The enormous body, wide enough, long enough to hold a human, carefully folded, knees hugged to chest, as infants once were, the archaeologists say, back in the Jumon period, arranged for burial in clay jars. As the notion blossoms, the characteristic crease familiar to his, to his fans deepens between his thick eyebrows, and he drops to all fours, peering into the fish's open mouth, trying to illuminate that abyss with the faint light of his cell phone, just barely revealing inside another duller sheen, some unnatural object, a solid mass edged with black fur. Or hair? The mime of grief he begins now is exquisite, very Japanese, stamping feet and delicate hand gestures. He extracts a fan from his inside coat pocket, leaving nothing to the imagination but the sound of a koto. After a few minutes, the interpreter is about to step in, but I stop him. Let him finish, I say. He's exploring. Do whatever it is you people do, I told the interpreter to tell the actor earlier. Here is your motivation. And then I recited the line I'd been worrying in my head ever since you last read the line you signed off with. All they'll find in the locker at Kamiacho is fear and whale meat. The same line spoken, recited by the young man whose call had awakened me last night, my first night in Tokyo before the line and Ted, my Japanese phone. Who was he, and how had he gotten the number? Unless you. The interpreter stared at me as he translated, as if maybe I'd misspoken, but the actor accepted my direction without alarm, the crease between his eyebrows suggesting he'd even been anticipating this, as if the line was some sort of code I'd been meant to deliver to him, a code that might permit my entry into, or that he, the actor, was part of the same conspiracy into which I'd been groping my way all along during those nights online corresponding with you sinking deeper and deeper into your whirlpool heart. On the flight over, I dreamt us going down in the dark into the black Pacific. How did I survive? And her, my wife, her flight went down too, the two of us taking up residence together again like Izanami and Izanagi on a fragment of charred fuselage, planting gardens across an archipelago of flotsam caught in the Pacific gyre. Cultivating radioactive fish and seedlings to feed the new Japan we create through our ritualized running. A race in, light, in our own likenesses, quite literally, each face, each body, only fractionally different from ours, so that it was near impossible to tell one from. And there, even I, somehow, have become Japanese. While she looks, as she always has, like one of them. From beneath a red parasol, she speaks, and I understand every word about the process of fermenting indigo leaves into sukumo. She's made to dye our hobbies. Or that was a film I was. The Japanese next to me was watching Kaoru, an accountant making his home in Portland now, headed home to some western suburb, but for the first time in six years, one historical scenario after another he watched, Samurai and Kamikaze, General Nogi and Empress Chinu, all the way from LAX to... Or it was the film I was writing, or it's this one. What do you think, the interpreter whispers, as the detective continues. I think I was hoping I'd spot her, maybe tomorrow, at the arrivals hall, or later in the market yard, wearing the same green scarf and bug-eyed sunglasses, my surgical mask and salary, salary man suit disguised enough that I might follow her and unnoticed to your rendezvous. Is it the Café Diamond, maybe, where you first met, by the Kaminari Mom? Or why not your apartment, crowded with novels, your translations of Mishima and Kawabata and Abe, all your Japanese books, every one a translation that gives you away, as one of us, a gaijin after all. Wasn't it you, you that wrote, you are destined to meet yourself waiting for the traveler? You, you fraud. Wasn't it you that turned me on?
pause there <laughs> with that with that um, with this book. Um, and I just want to finish with a short section from a project that I'm working on now. Um, and um, to, to do it. Um, the, for some time, I've been thinking about this nonfiction project about my family's immigration from Mexico, the history of Mexico. My father's family came from Jalisco State from Tequila. Um, uh, my mother uh, immigrated in the 20s, and I uh, grew up in a uh, very assimilated household. My mother is Anglo. We didn't speak Spanish at home. And so, you know, for you know, most of my life, I felt you know, in some ways just uh, sort of separated from that, um, from that, from the heritage of, of my father's family. And, you know, later on in my life, that became sort of much more increasingly important to me. And I was trying to think about sort of how to address this. I was talking to my grandmother, getting her stories of immigration. And uh, right about the time I was ready to sort of like try to address this um, uh, this world, I you know, my, both my grandmother and my father passed, and I was sort of left with these recordings. Um, and and you know, um, I kind of embarked on this process of just sort of tracking down these these histories. Um, we have a we have a history of telling stories in the family that are not always true. <laughs> so so it was sort of interesting to me to try and track down some of these things that um, my grandmother had told me that um, that even my father and, and, and his sisters didn't believe completely. Um, in fact, there was quite a lot of truth there um, that uh, they probably should have given her credit for. Um, but um, so so this project you know is sort of taking me to Mexico and, and New Mexico and, and um, Texas to, to sort of. Um, you know, follow up on these stories, and um, there's also sort of elements of fiction worked in here um, that you know, which I'm sort of imagining. There, there was a there was a Mejia as um, uh, part of Cortez's crew back in, uh, during the conquest, um, which is sort of strange for me. You know, to sort of think about you know the, the, the father of the line in some sense. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think Tokyo and the sort of questions of appropriation that I was dealing with there it definitely sort of helped me to think about some of the problems of the text that I'm trying to create, too. I told you that, and I feel now I'm, I'm cheating you because I'm not going to actually read that aspect of the, of the project. Um, more recently, uh, as we all know, you know, from around this time last year, um, there was a, a, a large group of migrants coming up from Central America. America. Um, and that story um, and the story that wasn't being told around that is really um, you know, compelling to me. I mean, and when I say compelling, I mean it made me angry. Right? That, 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 you know, sort of how much was not being said. Um, and so that also became part of the project. Um, a lot of this, you know, I've been thinking about this project a lot in terms of travel, of walking, of, 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 of a journey, journeying back. Um, you know, through through text, through archives, through history, etc., um, and to sort of have this 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 real you know sort of journey coming north, um, you know, just sort of took on a lot of uh, you know, sort of became very powerful for me. Um, so I I started kind of developing this uh, sort of chronicle essay about um, about that you know, um, that group. Of people. Um, I'm trying to avoid saying the word here, because I'm still not quite sure how, how, how to deal with that. Um, and, and I will say, sort of in advance, that, that you know, I'm still not even sure about this project. Right? That, that, that again, sort of questions of appropriation um, are present in my, in my mind, and sort of the way in which I'm trying to sort of address that through address, and also sort of keeping in mind the ways in which the filters through which I receive the stories that I'm trying to. To, to deal with. So I'll just say, this, this is actually um, uh, just a short, a short section of that that starts at the, Shuti, the, the Suchiate crossing between Guatemala and, and, and Mexico, um, a bridge where um, the, um, the caravan was sort of stopped temporarily by um, gates and then um, eventually was allowed to pass. Um, there are, I'm not going to signal them too much here, but um, there are direct quotes um, from here 
uh, 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 littered in here. There, uh, there's one name that I refuse to say. Um, that should be obvious. There's one word that I refuse to use. Um, uh, and so, anyway, this is uh, this, this is called Estas en tu casa, which is um, uh, was the name of a, of a program that was introduced shortly after the caravan passed into Mexico. It was intended by you know on the part of the government to try and encourage people to stay and um, and, and and sell and find work. Um, which is a phrase that I'm going to complicate. The Suchiate crossing is closed. The bridge spanning the river gated at the midpoint. The first day, they beat you back, but you come again. You will always come again. They let women and children pass. You throw some rocks, they fire over bullets. You wait, you refuse. How the pilgrim appeals for mercy. And you know this gate will open like the last, like the next. These are not things that can resist you. Don't you know, the reporter asks her, don't you know that won't let you in? A man drops to the water, like the final moment of despair, but others are ready to snag him, for him to help them ferry across a pregnant woman, a farmer, a nurse, a high school graduate seeking an IT job. What else am I supposed to do, she says, almost affectless, as if to no one, as if there were no camera there. He was murdered, her husband. Their other child, still across the river, waits for the next raft of boards and tires. An act of suffering and devotion. We diminish the term by alighting and not witnessing both, and there is no pilgrimage without them, only holiday. If the tourist pursues chameleonic blending, a game-like negotiation with the foreign, the pilgrim wants to be seen, not to be pitied or admired, but to be known to have abandoned, prepared to be stripped further and beaten in accident seeking transformation. He pleads to be made different. She would be crushed and constituted otherwise around the wound that led to the road. The pilgrim is not innocent. What seems stable becomes a wave. Hands collapse, collapse the fence and the crowd flows through. We must resist the word, but we cannot avoid others. Force, action, mass, the exhilaration and dread attached to the image, let alone the words, of the desire you embody the power to overwhelm the obstacles to which we inherently defer. To have what you say you want, what you think you need, feel, you deserve, what you have earned by surviving, surviving so long, coming so far, for having a body. Your power is belief, reasoning based on faith, on fairy tale, poor, poor logic, wishes, magic. The truth is, I'm only afraid of God, is a person just like us. In Tapachula, you populate the ten city waiting beneath the arcades. Five thousand, they say now, maybe even seven, extending for over a mile. They're making calculations, twenty to thirty miles a day, sixteen hundred miles to Juarez, only twelve hundred to McAllen. They'll call out the National Guard, they say, the Army, the Marines. The media poll has grown, too. A buzzing flock of drones, you're being watched more than ever. You are being seen. May your image be graven on our minds until we are transformed into your likeness. The pilgrim exposes herself to contingencies of water, air, and earth, root, thorn, tooth, and nail. No protection but her pilgrim's clothes, worn t-shirt and bejeweled jeans, blanket, nylon tarp, ball cap, and trainers, the embrace of others. She exposes herself to the scrutiny of alien communities, to their spectra of ethics, laws, and prejudices. The pilgrim is a perpetual supplicant trespasser, mobility, making her criminal. Here and gone, gone on, unmoored, unhoused, vagrant, derelict, how easily description becomes judgment. <coughs> he has fallen from a truck, run over by another vehicle. No one knows him. The shirt says Columbia. The wristband striped blue and white, bearing five stars. Every vehicle heading north, overloaded with bodies, Flatbuds, pickups, cars, buses, a gas tanker, a garbage truck, a cattle trailer. Police stop them, make you get off and walk. You limp past that man, broken open, a streak of blood marking the lane. He's missing a shoe. How will he get home, you wonder, as they hoist him over the barrier? Where does he belong now? Who's left to be notified, and who will make that call? These two are our violences. Tonight, you'll rest on the street in Wiesla, you and your husband securing your daughter between you, 
tomorrow too so the children can recover and receive medical attention. They say you pause to honor that man with a broken head, another indication that you're a community, a colony in exile. He is the first of you, they say, to die on the road. But how do they know? Remember, Melvin Gomez died on the highway. Henry Diaz killed in the mailing at Suciate. And Francis Lindre reports six more killed when the vehicle they were riding rolled off the road. Eleven more injured, four of them kids, the driver running off into the jungle to hide. They say that man is still lying beside a dumpster outside of town, collecting flies. Clothes laid out on the road. Donations. Who exchange your home jersey for mango. A new pair of jeans, an extra pair of shoes tied to your pack. The path is long, but it is also often clear. The pilgrim knows where he is going. There is a map or a line that needs no map. The line is the map, and there is no other landscape, only the community of pilgrims, the community and its assailants. A crowd traveling along a vector that will arrive at an end point she imagines as smaller than America, but that also contains it, a house in a quiet neighborhood where everyone sleeps well where no one comes to the door demanding this body or any other. Thanks. Mm. We've got time for a few questions if people want to have a little conversation uh, before we wrap it up. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. So, you know, it's like your text basically have circumvent certain navigate the globe. <laughs> so I'm curious how did you see that? Consider that at I feel like this last text is uh, that I'm coming home in some way, trying to sort of, that I'm coming to, to re-see what home might be. Like I left home and I realized, you know, when I, with, with forgetfulness. Um, I started my college career as a music major and that's kind of where that project got started, that um, you know, I was introduced to the work of Anton Weber and puzzled by it, you know, that you know, writing a novel in response to it was kind of, that's how, that's how I've, I've, I've continued to approach writing is, is, is um, responding and, re and wrestling with problems, not necessarily creating a conclusive narrative, right? Um, so, you know, in that sense, I feel like I was struggling with all the sort of European modernism and postmodernism that I had you know, grown up with in school, right, and sort of learned, and that I embraced in such a way that um, it, that that you know that was that was who I wanted to be, who, who I wanted to become. I mean, Weber, in a lot of ways, is kind of like an aesthetic hero to me. Um, the whole fascist part aside, <laughs> it may or may not be right. I mean, that's part of the question. But, um, anyway, um, so. You know, you know, Tokyo kind of started around the same period, right? Again, I was sort of, um, sort of following an, an interest, um, an aesthetic interest, like things Japanese. Um, I'm, I'm quoting here. There are books from the 19th century, right? Sort of like these sort of early American interpretations of Japan, uh, you know, things Japanese. Um, and, and I was sort of following that, and, and, and then eventually over several years, as I mentioned, I kind of came to question my my pursuit of that and sort of how, how I've been pursuing it. And I think that that really got me to think um, in, in, in new ways about you know, sort of how I had been trying to look at my own personal history, my own family history, the history that I had largely, that I, that I had largely not investigated. You know? um, and um, you know, but that, you know, had become important to me just, you know, kind of in large part because of, you know, the aging of the family and the loss of these, the, these connections. Um, and, you know, and, and also sort of thinking about, you know, ways in which I might, way, ways that, that that would help me find to, you know, respond against the Europeanisms that had kind of dominated my intellectual life, right? And, um, and so that's how that's how I finally have, have come to this other project now. And I'm sort of trying to figure out ways in which um, that, that I can actually enact that that, that resistance. Um, um, and, and it's not a complete rejection, right? I mean, I, I think I understand that 
any any sort of artistic experiment that I pursue is always going to be informed in some way by those European modernism and those and, and sort of those modern ideas. Um, but trying to trying to you know make those things wrestle, right, and, and really kind of enact the the the, the, the American mississac, right? I mean, sort of that mixture that I, I, I want to see as. You know, I understand that in Mexico that has a particular sort of political meaning, right? Um, but I also sort of, I want to think about that as, you know, this kind of, you know, compelling intellectual struggle. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Okay, um, so in your fiction, I feel like in talking about Tokyo and what you read, there's this, um, like, a big emphasis on form and, and the role that form plays in telling a narrative and maybe telling a story that doesn't have such a clean ending. But, you know, like this, this thing that uh, you spoke about, um, how do you see that translating to your nonfiction? Like, this project, what role was form going to play, and is it going to be something similar? Right. Yeah, I mean... Um, it's interesting. I, I, I've sort of struggled with when I when I when I realized that I was actually embarking on a, a kind of chronicle, right? Um, I, as you do, you sort of like where do you end it, right? Um, and and you know we haven't reached the end, right, in any way. And I and I think at least for the moment it ends um, at the point the tear gas is fired at, at you know, children, right? Um, uh, which which seems to me sort of like, I mean, it's certainly not the culmination of the most heinous thing that's happened on the border, right? Um, but it, it, it was maybe the first of that particular period, um, and I kind of don't want to go any further, you know. I mean, that, that is to say, with the Chronicle, like, all the, everything that's happened since will be addressed. But, um, but as far as, like, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, like, nonfiction is just, there is a... A much more sort of complicated sense of, of, of an ending, right? I mean, for me, anyway, um, you know, I still, I think for this particular project, I, I, I don't know yet what it's going to be, um, what it is, and I think I'm fine with it being, um, you know, this, the, you know, sort of locked in an image of, of, of indecision, right, of, of uncertainty, um, because I don't, I don't feel, I'm not pursuing it as though I'm going to find an answer um, to any about who I am or, or, or anything like that. Um, you know, I think, like, with, with this, this novel in particular, you know, I think the idea is to, you know, narrate an experience, which is both intellectual and emotional, um, and, you know, you know, just allow those resonances to sit with the, with the reader. I think we were talking before, like, I mean, a lot of this comes from sort of thinking about visual art in a way that, you know, it doesn't have a narrative, right? it just, I just respond to it, and then I often, you know, hopefully it will, link, it will linger with me and I'll continue to struggle with it, and that's kind of what I think my goal is for every, every narrative that I'm working with. So the, uh, the first section you read, the yeah. you mentioned that many people thought you had gone to Japan when you went back to Paris. Yeah. Um, I was convinced myself. Yeah, yeah. I was just Sorry. wondering, like, uh, what exactly is your process with like finding all those details for places I've never been? Right. Yeah. Um, National Geographic was a good help. Was a big help. <laughs> um, but then I spent a lot of time. Like research has always been a big part of my process. Um, so you know, and I and I, I think a lot of this, you know, I'm not a like a, a super uh, organized researcher. I mean, because I because I'm quoting, I have to be more organized, so because so, so I can cite people um, at the end. But um, I just kind of follow my inclinations. Um, so you know, with with Tokyo, trying to trying to it, de develop this sense of Tokyo, I was reading, you know, um, I was re reading Japanese fiction and Japanese poetry, um, some works of you know on Buddhism and. Uh, you know, just kind of trying to evoke an environment of Japanese culture, right? Um, and so, you know, I think I realized at the moment, even if I didn't, even if it wasn't intentional at the time that I was writing it, I think I was always aware at some point of that, that this could never be anything but parody, 
right? That the that the character of Ito was a, was was always a completely fake Japanese, um, but that um, you know, so so in some way, I guess you know, the the the, the air of satire or irony, perhaps you know, sort of ameliorated, um, the, you know, what was what kind of appropriation was going on there or something. But um, but yeah, I mean, a, a lot of it had to do with research and looking at images, you know, just trying to sort of like create this create this environment. Um, I honestly felt like when, when I first had that experience of somebody who had been to Tokyo and spent some significant time there and, and asked me when I had been, I was shocked. Like, I really wouldn't have thought that it was that convincing. Uh, I have since, I, I meant to mention, I have since been to Tokyo. And that was part of the, part of the thing, too, was that like, I kind of wanted to go to, fight, to sort of see all the things that I got wrong, right? I mean, the idea that, um, that Ito's, you know, would walk... In, in Skiji without galoshes, for example, which was, I mean, that was like this sort of moment in that in that first section where, you know, he feels the water coming up through the seats of his shoes. Like, that would never happen. Anybody who had worked at Skiji in their entire life like him would never be walking there without galoshes. And there's, you know, there's excuses that could be made for that. And, and most people probably wouldn't even notice it. But but it, it, it got to me, like, you know, sort of thinking about, yeah, these are, these there are, there are all sorts of things, not only that I don't know, but there are all sorts of questions about Japanese-ness and Japanese culture in Japan, Tokyo, et cetera, that I would never think to ask because I'm not Japanese. Um, and so, so that's part of, you know, with the images. Um, I uh, had encountered the work of the, the artist um, uh, Yamaguchi Akira um, before I went, and so I got in touch with him as a representative when I was there and asked them if he would contribute some some images, um, because I wanted, you know, even if it wasn't uh, a completely coherent voice, I wanted this Japanese presence to be, like an, a, a real Japanese presence to be there in the book, sort of as a counterbalance in some sense. Um, to... Could you just talk a bit about how you see the images working? Because it was just sort of playing on its own slideshow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so the the order of the images in the, on the slideshow is the order that, uh, in which the images appear in the book. Um, but they're they're spaced out, you know, throughout the the third section. Um, and you know, uh, Yamaguchi's images at one point do sort of intersect with the text, um, but for the most part, they are their own kind of narrative, if you will, um, and they all have. Um, uh, captions um, as well, and I'll just um, pull out a couple here. Um, one of them is the there was the salary man, uh, sort of with his head down, his, his hands uh, folded, and the caption is to arrange oneself like the iris, upright but approaching repose. Um, the one with the with the woods and the bamboo, this caption is he got caught up in a variety of fantasies. Which could have settled his soul. Um, the one with the the man in the in the, the short hobbies at the at the festival. Um, the, the caption is, "I'm sure they'll be walking in the door any minute." So, um, you know, again, it's like similar to what I just said about about you know Yamaguchi's images, kind of like creating their own narrative. I, the, the photos too, like create this. This, their own kind of narrative. Where do they come from? Who's writing the captions? Like it's, it seems pretty clear that it's nobody in the narrative. So you know, but but who is it, right? Um, and so I, I had mentioned before, you know, my part of my inspiration for that was um, the images in Breton, uh, Andre Breton's Nadia. Um, he has the you know several black and white photographs um, that they also have captions, but his captions are actually drawn from the text. Um, but in, in you know, in a lot of ways, I mean, their interaction with the text is, is sort of like a development of this theory of, sort of the surreal, right? In some cases, particularly in the first section of the book, it feels as though they're sort of demonstrative of that. And you know, I, I what I liked about it was the placement and the caption. And then you know, um, what I wanted to sort of move away from him by sort of allowing those things to kind of take off on their own uh, thing, and just you know, again, kind of like layer new possibilities into this text in such a way that, you know, hopefully they would be intriguing, um, but they would also, you know, just create more mystery. 
And the other thing, too, that I wanted to play with was, um, you know, I mean, they're always taken from a Western eye, right? And sort of, um, in some cases, I admit that they're, you know, they feel like maybe a typical tourist photo, right, of something weird. Um, and, you know, but then, you know, I was, I was hoping that, you know, sort of take it out of context that they might actually sort of achieve something more than that. Um, and they're, I mean, obviously they're all cropped, too. Thanks. Thank you.